It looks like we're actually live for the GraphQL track. So welcome everybody for coming today. We're super excited for the actually really high caliber lineup that uh, came together here. So I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, I'm not gonna take too much time with this intro today. Just as a quick kind of uh, heads up, this is not a beginner GraphQL track. So none of these talks today are gonna be sort of beginner topics. If you have questions about GraphQL, there are plenty of other API Day videos on YouTube about sort of what is GraphQL, uh, and that's a good place to go get caught up if you have some of those kind of questions. The rest about of today's talk are basically the current state of GraphQL, where it's gonna be going, some best practices. And to kick us off, we're gonna learn about the rise of GraphQL uh, as a database API from Karthik Rao. And uh, Karthik, how you feeling? You ready to go? Yes, absolutely. Great. All right. So I'm going to give you your full time slot here and uh, take it away. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, based on where you're tuning in from. And I'm Karthik, and I'm founder at Incredible.dev. And at Incredible.dev, we're trying to simplify the process of creation of technical videos and videos on software and code and make it easy, collaborative, and fun to do. Um, and previously, I was working at DGraph, which is a San Francisco-based uh, open source graph database startup. And before that, I was working at Minio, which is a Palo Alto-based open source alternative. Um, uh, open source, uh, it's a startup. Palo Alto-based startup is working on open source alternative for Amazon S3. So um, let's get started then. Uh, here's a quick look at the table of contents. To start with, um, we'll have a overview of what this talk about and what is that you can expect from this talk. And then we'll look at why GraphQL and databases are kind of in marriage, which you're increasingly seeing by both the database vendors and third-party startups and uh, enterprises. And we we'll look at the landscape of GraphQL and databases and look at the popular choices that you have to get GraphQL APIs on top of your database right out of the box. And, um, you know, and, and there are a few of these tools uh, you can see in the list. And then we'll go through how do you make the right choice for your use case. OK. So I think GraphQL doesn't need any introduction. We all know, you know GraphQL has taken the app development world by storm. And uh, I, I, I assume that you know, most of the API developers today know what GraphQL is, and at least to some extent know its benefits. And uh, you know, let's, let's have a very quick recap of some of the benefits that GraphQL brings into API development, right? It gives you a lot of flexibility in API design and gives a lot of productivity for front-end and back-end teams and makes it very, very intuitive in expressing your UI data requirements. And, uh, and then you know, uh, the community now has a plethora of tools to do a lot of things, including from documentation, uh, you know, in generating boilerplate code for you, so the tooling is really, really powerful. And hence, you can see a lot of big enterprises to startups all over the world use GraphQL. But you know, while uh, the meteoric rise of GraphQL uh, in API development hasn't been a surprise for a lot of us, but it's definitely been a surprise to see the increasing trend of database vendors providing GraphQL API as a way to access the database. You know, uh, this is something I think most GraphQL experts never anticipated. And uh, this trend is just going on and on. So to start with, let's see why we increasingly see this trend. So before this, you know, this is how we traditionally uh, uh, develop a GraphQL server or even a REST server on top of your database. Right? You have a web server and generally you write code, lots and lots of code, and you take care of running your web server and you use the popular programming or scripting language of your choice to build your web server out. And then to interact with the database, you use the database ORM or the database client library. And the web server interacts with the ORM and the ORM interacts with the database. And that's how the communication traditionally happens. So when I mean out of the box support for GraphQL uh, provided by database vendors or third party uh, tools, what I mean is that you do not have to run or code your web server and you don't even have to write a lot of boilerplate code with ORM uh, to implement your basic CRUD features. And that's exactly the advantage you get uh, with out-of-the-box support for GraphQL by databases. That is, uh, to repeat again, 
you don't have to write graphql resolvers or write a lot of boilerplate uh, code to implement your cred features and you don't even have to bother implementing or writing your web server and again you know one of the mostly uh, or like hotly debated or a very popular uh, subject of discussion for developers is what are the best practices should have to implement while using the word and or the database kind client library in terms of the number of connections to maintain in terms of the scale in terms of the load in terms of distribution of load so i think all of these are abstracted by using the out of the box support and uh, again you know um, the graphql support for database brings the best of everything you get being in the amazing graphql ecosystem so let's look at the popular choices um we have as of today to get out of the box support for graphql on top of your databases so hasura i think most of us uh, should be familiar with hasura we have i'm sure there is a lineup of few folks by um, hasura giving a talk in this conference too so hasura gives graphql api on top of postgres mysql um, tables without having to write any code and all you have to do is configure your database tables but hasura do not build a database you know you run and manage and host your database um they provide bunch of options and hasura runs as a graphql layer and an additional web server on top of your database and hasura is open source uh and they also give you a bunch of options to run even on top of some distributed sql compatible databases which means like if you are trying to deal with terabytes of data uh so you get the best of both worlds you get the of uh, ability to scale with distributed sql databases and then also you have the luxury and uh, convenience of getting graphql apis for your cred operations without having to write code and hasura is also available as a saas but again remind you that you manage your own database and hasura gives you out of the box graphql layer on top of your database so another popular um, option that you have as a developer today is to use dgraph and dgraph is a graph database so it's not a relational database it's not a non relational database it's not a document store it's a graph database i think other popular choice in this category in neo4j uh, both of them offer graphql support on top of the graph database and uh, dgraph is open source and is distributed which means that you can seamlessly scale horizontally and uh, dgraph is a database vendor which means they ship their own database and also the graphql layers in ingrained right within the database so the graphql layer is not an additional web server which is separated from your database and uh, to initialize dgraph and to obtain graphql apis on top of your data it's as simple as just write a graphql schema file which defines all your data requirements for your application and for your ui that's it um you know just you compose a schema file hand it over to dgraph you have your cred apis just focus on your front end no need to worry about writing lot of boilerplate code for implementing your cred operations on the database so let's look at couple of options before we get into how do you make the right choice for your use case okay so another alternative which falls into a very different category in the landscape is founder db um founder db is proprietary unlike hasura or dgraph and they are also database vendor and founder db is a multi model database and it's a saas only database which means that you cannot run founder db during development on your machine locally or you cannot manage it in your infrastructure so it's a um, it's saas only service proprietary multi model and again uh, the initializing founder is as simple as just compose a graphql schema defining your data requirements so the last one in the category um, i guess like uh, if we have a lot of javascript developers here it's of no surprise what mongodb is so it doesn't need any introduction at all so but i'm not sure that most of you know that mongodb also gives and they recently announced out of the box graphql support to deal with the collections and uh, again you know it's very easy it's a document store very compatible if you are uh looking at your entire data as a json and um and mongodb is again available as a saas platform so you don't have to worry about managing uh mongodb in your own infrastructure okay now we looked at bunch of options for you know uh, databases on database vendors and third party tools which provides you out of the box graphql support you know without having to write any code 
or we don't have to run your web server. Now, if you are building your project or if you're working on your product or your startup or if you're an enterprise and you want the convenience of uh, GraphQL on top of your database, you don't have to write code. Now, in a world where we have so many options, uh, what is the right one? What is the right one for you? And how do we make this choice? So let's go through you know, some of the ground rules which you need to consider and think about before you make your choice. The first thing you need to always ask is, you know, are you comfortable using the database without GraphQL? I think I have increasingly seen this trend, uh, even while I was at DGraph, that a lot of the people without really thinking about, am I comfortable with running this database? You know, am I comfortable with using the database, uh, using its native query language rather than the convenience of GraphQL? So it's very important you think about this before you pick a database just because you have a convenience of GraphQL. The reason is that a um, lot of the custom logic or business logic has to be implemented manually using the native query language. So the, what you get out of the box without writing any code in terms of GraphQL APIs are only good for your basic CRUD operations on top of your data model. So if you're writing business logic, if you're not comfortable with the native query language, if you're not comfortable with running the database, if you're not comfortable with the data model you know, of the database, I think um, you'll be stuck there. And the next thing you need to ask is that before you look at the GraphQL convenience on top of the databases, does this database fit my use case? You know, um, we'll look at a bunch of use cases and you know, we'll, we'll see like depending on which use case you have and which would be a good choice. Uh, but this is a question you need to really ask yourself and think a lot about before you make the choice. And the third one is, uh, which is, which is a hard problem for any new database in the market, you know, is that do you really trust the database, right? And the, you know, one of the, I think, uh, the key parameter for success of Hasura, you know, a wonderful product, incredibly uh, well done, you know, great community is that Behind Hasura, there is a database which most of the market and the developers trust. You know, Postgres, uh, see MySQL, other database which you know most developers in this world are comfortable with, and they can sleep peacefully knowing that their data is safe. So I think uh, you need to ask the question that uh, with increasingly, you know, you see many many new database vendors who add support for GraphQL. Before you jump into the bandwagon, you need to really trust the database, um, and definitely, right? Uh, the last. The last thing you look at it, you know, once you make all these three choices is to uh, be sold for the GraphQL convenience, you know, how easy it is to initialize your data model and how easy it is to get all the GraphQL APIs you need for your operations and how easy it is to express the business logic. So the last parameter which you can evaluate is to see how easy it is to achieve all the GraphQL operations you need on top of the database. Okay, now we heard now about, you know, how do you make the right choice, but just to make this very simple for you, let's consider a couple of use cases and understand, you know, uh, which are the some scenarios and what are the good choices to make in, in these scenarios. So let's say if you're building a social application and you need an activity feed and recommendation. Now, in such a use case, you need to model your data as a graph and, 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 and you're building a massive social graph and you're feeding an activity and a recommendation model on your homepage, a homepage as a feed. Uh, it is it is preferably good to go to a graph database and dgraph and neo4j fits really well into this use case right this is an example to see that you look at the use case you look at how should you model your data and you look at whether are you comfortable uh, with the database and does the database excel for this use case and once all the stick marks are uh, done that's when you move to the convenience of graphql and the next is what is the primary data store for your application Right. Uh, when you have some special use cases like feed and recommendation and search, uh, but you also need a primary database apart from the special cases. And I think that's where you know you can uh, very easily pick Postgres, MySQL, or SQL compatible uh, distributed databases, which are not yet battle tested, but uh, increasingly becoming very popular. Maybe the likes of Yugabyte DB or Cockroach DB, and uh, that's when Hasura becomes a uh, Swiss Army knife for you not just as a data access layer for your DB, but it can become a data access layer for your entire infrastructure. So the last use case is pretty simple, right? Let's say you're building um, an application where the data model is pretty simple. In this example, you can see an attendance application. 
uh, I guess like assume that you don't uh, expect more than 50,000 to 30,000 users and pretty simple and not so complex data model. Uh, and if you are building your application in JavaScript or if you're a fan of JSON and Mongo, I think uh, it's it's better to go with the support for uh, support which MongoDB has provided for GraphQL. Okay, now this is a popular question which a uh, lot of GraphQL developers ask that now you want the best of all the worlds, right? Let's imagine that you're building the next Twitter or next LinkedIn where you, you need the um, social experience and you need a graph database to build that. Then you want to store all the user information and you want, to want a relational database, right? And let's say you have um, some simple data which you want to store as a document data, right? Let's say you have a, a bunch of databases which is part of your architecture and you have hundreds of microservices. Now, how do I use all of this in, um, you know, in a simple setup so that I still have the best of all worlds and also the convenience of GraphQL? So here's how you do it, right? And I think this is this this image is um, picked from the architecture diagram in Hasura's side. I really love uh, what they have done. I think the solution in this uh, case, and even you see that a lot of companies like Netflix have openly come out come out come out and uh, you know shared their use case that they started using GraphQL as a data aggregation layer between hundreds of microservices and data stores. And I think that's the future to go, that you have a unified API layer, which is uh, managed by a third party software, which offers you a GraphQL uh, API to aggregate all the data sources behind. And then in the background, you can have multiple GraphQL web servers, and this could be uh, you know databases which are giving you GraphQL APIs, this could be your GraphQL uh, web servers, or this could be even REST web, REST web servers. Um, so you can have this, wide variety of services, GraphQL or non-GraphQL in your backend, but your data access layer is completely managed with the GraphQL API, which takes care of stitching and aggregating data from multiple data sources so that the client has a unified view and your ap application architecture is pretty clean. I think this is something what Kafka did for, you know, data access layer for the big data system, right? You have data coming in from multiple systems and multiple sources and the whole architecture gets pretty chaotic. And Kafka kind of unified the entire stream so that you have one stream to which all of the data gets into and funnels out into different destinations later. So that is something very similar. I assume that uh, GraphQL API layer is doing for the API world. That's it. Um, you know, feel free to uh, ping me on Twitter at the rate uh, hack into shraw or uh, check out incredible.dev. And if you uh, want to approach me in a more traditional way, feel free to reach out to me at Karthik at incredible.dev. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, everyone. All right. What a great talk. That's um, near and dear to my heart <laughs> as, a, as another GraphQL vendor in the space. Um, I think there were some interesting, uh, interesting observations there. I just want to check real quick. I'm trying to see if there's any questions in the slide. If there's any questions, okay, we have one. Good. Um, okay. Would you consider Redis graph? I would consider a Redis graph. I think um, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure Redis graph. It's um, it can be a unified API layer or it's just a GraphQL API for Redis. So if it's a, just a GraphQL access layer for Redis. I think if it's convenient for you to access Redis in a GraphQL way, um, you know, please go for it. But uh, again, Redis, uh, it's it's highly debatable when it comes to something as simple as Redis because most of the operations are pretty simple. It's just a key value access in most of the cases, right? And it's a cached layer. So while it comes to databases, the advantages are more because now your query language can be proprietary. Different databases have different query languages. And it gets really hard to wrap your head around tens of uh, proprietary uh, query languages and expressing your data requirements. And I think that's when the you know GraphQL, you know the win for GraphQL, or win for picking GraphQL becomes more clear and evident. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I think it's um, it's definitely a strong strong argument. There's that there's that middle there. I think you put a, a I think you identified correctly the pain point at the moment, which is when your business logic needs to live more inside of a, a native interface with the database, 
right. then GraphQL sits more as an abstraction on top of that. Yeah. Um, I think that's a definitely identifying the primary pain point. If, if in the magical world, if somebody were to create a GraphQL interface that was able to essentially act as a GraphQL ORM that was a utility kit for m multiple databases, would you see that as solving the primary pain point behind when to choose GraphQL or what would you, how would you view that? Yeah, I think you're talking about something like Prisma, right? Uh, so, like, yeah, quite similar to Prisma, actually. Quite similar to Prisma, right? And unified ORM layer uh, on top of multiple databases. Um, I think that um, uh, I would still rather, you know, uh, if if, I'm, if you want the convenience of GraphQL, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, right out of the box on top of database, the reason I go for it and I get sold for it because I don't want to write any boilerplate code. You know, I want to keep going uh, up and going pretty fast. Um, uh, I think in such a case, most of the times I would rather just run a Hasura on top of Postgres. Um, but this ORM would still be convenient if I want to express my business logic on top of, you know, let's say I have some complex business logic which I need to express and I need a ORM which makes, uh, gives me a unified way to express my query on top of multiple different databases and run my own web server. Let's say implement my own web server. I think that's when uh, it would be convenient. But again, it depends on how irritating is the pain of using one of the standard ORMs, you know, for you to uh, write your code. Mm -hmm. Because I don't see people use all Postgres, MySQL, Oracle DB, all of them together. It would be either Postgres, it would be either SQL, or it would either be uh, Oracle. Right. Um, so if I'm using any one of the relational databases in my stack, I can easily go with the standard ORM or the standard database client that's offered. It doesn't really help me out if you say I give you support for MySQL and other SQL variants. But if you tell me that you give me a unified ORM, which can help me, uh, you know, write queries and express all my queries in a similar way on different data sources. Let's say I have Mongo, Cassandra, Elasticsearch and you know, uh, HBase, and then I can write a query using the same ORM to all of them and pretty much the same way. I think that would be more useful. Very cool. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting space. And I, I'm, we're obviously at GraphCMS, we're bullish about GraphQL. Uh, we think that everybody should hop on the train. But um, no, I, I really appreciate the talk. It looks like there's no more questions in the, in the space. How can people follow up with you, find you online, track what you're doing? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, as, I said, as I shared, uh, Twitter is the best place to stay in touch uh, if you want to reach out to me or you know, for staying connected. Um, cool. so it's at the rate hack into SH, SH stand for shell, and Aryabo Rao is my last name. Hack into Rao. Yeah. And that's also available on the speaker profile page too. Uh, people can find you as well from, right. from API days. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring on the next speaker. And